And let me give you some examples of cases. Here's one, seven-year-old female. We get a lot of little ones. If a little one is coming into a locked facility, you know that's a serious, troubling kid because can't you just hold them? No. They headbutt, they bite, they kick, they scratch. You know, they're very difficult to hold. And if you hold one of these kids, the moment you touch them for a physical hold, you'll have to hold them for an hour to an hour and a half until they completely run out of steam. Because nothing will stop them except having no more energy and it's gone, been finished. And there's no reason for that because this condition will only last five minutes if you leave them alone. <laughs> you hold them and you gotta sit on them for an hour. And that's when they get hurt and that's when you're gonna get hurt. And it's unnecessary and it's the wrong strategy. Anyway, seven-year-old came to us, diagnosis bipolar. They're all diagnosed bipolar disorder. They had, she had uh, an onset of mood swings and chronic irritability at age six. Chronic, I want you to notice this term, chronic, not episodic during mania, but chronic irritability. All the time, irritable all the time. <clears throat> Since age six. Aren't all children grouchy at times? Of course. And if you're a parent and your child is grouchy and they come in from the, my, my granddaughter would come in from the backyard, it's hot in Texas. She'd come in, you know, overheated. She'd be hungry, thirsty, tired, hot. Now she'd, she'd be grouchy. And we expect under those conditions she'll be grouchy. But if she comes in and there's no reason for it, then I, I get the thermometer out and say, she's probably sick. There's some reason for it. If you're chronically irritable, there's gotta be something else. There's also a reason, but it's not that easy to figure out. But she comes in with this, she presents with this. She's had six psychiatric hospitalizations. She's aggressive, impulsive, and hyperactive, diagnosed ADHD and an oppositional defiant disorder. Very common, we get comorbidity with ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder. Very common. <clears throat> on her medication on admission to Meridol was res Respidol, Seroquel, two antipsychotics, and lithium, uh, a medication they all use for, bi for bipolar disorder, and clonidine. Clonidine was the only medicine that was really helping her as far as we were concerned. The other medicines we got rid of immediately. Um, clonidine is an anti, it, it's a, I'm not gonna explain it to you, but it's an anticholinergic medicine and it's, um, it's a medicine that, we, that our psychiatrists sometimes will use. It is not exactly the, the ideal medicine um, for the frontal lobe, we really prefer some of the newer medicines that have come out, come out of neurology, and um, the medicines that are used in, in traumatic brain injury, which we're starting to use. Um, one of them is called amantadine, and we, that we use that much more often now. <clears throat> but um, don't take my word for any medicines. I mean, I'm, it's just opinions, remember? Opinions? All right. So we switched, the, we got rid of all these uh, antipsychotics, put, them, put her on an, uh, something bottom up and top down. Uh, to stabilize the limbic system and to improve and stimulate the frontal. And we left her on clonidine. And then we did the uh, antisocial, we did play therapy, we did parent training, use positive discipline, all those things. And this is the kind of thing that respond, she responded to those kinds of things. So these, these are medicines that are either top down or bottom up. Okay. Bottom up, top down. They're either one, one of those two categories. We're trying typically either to stimulate the front, the brakes, or to stabilize the limbic uh, rage button, the, the amygdala, okay? All right, so <clears throat> let's go through some of the slides. What is DMDD? What exactly is it? Well, the f funny thing is that they don't really know exactly what it is. It's new. Um, the condition has only been around for, a, you know, now two years, less, less than two years. So what is it? <clears throat> We had a condition, a condition that was not a DSM diagnosis, called severe mood dysregulation. Severe mood dysregulation. It's not a DSM. <laughs> Somebody made it up. A researcher, very good researcher at NI, National Institute of Health, NIH, made up this term, severe mood dysregulation, and applied it to chronic irritability, as opposed to the episodic irritability you see in bipolar. And so chronic irritability is, there's a lot of work that's been done on this condition called severe mood dysregulation. We have a lot of research on that, but it's not exactly the same thing as DMDD. 
It's, they, so they're not exactly the same, so we can't say we have research on DMDD. What we have is research on chronic irritability. Severe mood, mood dysregulation was, in, all these individuals had chronic irritability and explosive outbursts. So pretty similar, but not exactly the same as DMDD. But there's good research on that. So we know a lot about chronic irritability from this NIH research on severe mood dys dysregulation. But we don't know yet because this is a brand new thing, this, the DMDD. So let's talk about it a little bit. Aren't all, what is the, what is the, there's a controversy here. People are saying we're just, you know, we're, we're calling normal ch children's temper tantrums uh, a, a name. <laughs> now we, 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 can, we can treat them and we can give them medicine because we put a name on it. And it's just temper tantrums. Aren't all children irritable now and then? And don't they all have temper tantrums at age two, the terrible twos? You know? Sure, <laughs> we understand that. And the people who put this together understood that as well. And so they're talking about temper outbursts that, that, are, that occur at least three times a week, very, very frequent, much more frequent than you'd see anywhere in any other condition. And that there's irritable, angry moods almost every day in between the actual outbursts themselves. There's, you know, there's, it's a mood problem, there's a mood. Irritability is a mood. And by the way, you can't punish away irritability. It makes it worse. <laughs> Don't try it. Certainly not with these kids. Um, irritability is a mood. And so those moods are chronic. And it has to start at, at least age six. So we're not going to talk about terrible twos. We're going to talk about something that starts by age six. If you look at the research on, t on, on temper tantrums, what you'll see is that they are normal. Virtually, you know, maybe 85% of children show temper tantrums. So it's not, a, not 100%, but, a, but that's very normal. 85%, but they also show them and they go away by age five. So very few show temper tantrums into school age. By age six, typically the only ones that are showing temper tantrums at age six are those having problems. Those who are having some kind of a significant disruptive mood problem because that's not normal. And by the time you see the ones in age six that are having temper tantrums, they're not having temper tantrums like their regular kid does with frustration. They're having it for no reason <laughs> and they're overreacting uh, and they're very f uh, physical, violent. They just don't lay on the floor and scream and kick. They, they assault and attack and bite and scratch and throw things. So it's a, it's a much more severe type of, of temper reaction. But it occurs, so we're talking only from six, between six and 10, it's got onset at childhood. It's child onset, but not down to age two when they're to toddlers. And we're talking about with trouble functioning in multiple settings. So this is not just uh, one family that, that's reporting it, but it's to school and the neighbors and the friends and, and the, everybody's reporting. It's in more than one setting. And it's at least for a year that's going on. It's not just this last week, you know, this is, it's a long-term thing, chronic. Well, why did they put up this new diagnosis? Well, the reason is because everyone seems to agree that there's been an overdiagnosis of bipolar disorder. It's been a, an epidemic. Now you can't have an epidemic of a genetic disorder. And we know bipolar is largely genetic and you can't catch it. You can't, you can't, you can't have a, you know, uh, someone sneeze on you and you get bipolar. It doesn't work that way. It has to be, in, it's in the gene. So it may not be 100% genetic, but there's certainly a genetic, a very large genetic component to bipolar. And so you can't have a 20 fold increase in the frequency of this diagnosis unless someone's just overdoing it, using the diagnostic. And what happened was some psychiatrist decided that bipolar is not only an adult problem, but children have it, but they're different. Instead of being like the adults who have it episodically during mania, they have irritability all the time, and it's just the beginning of, of bipolar, and they're gonna eventually become adult bipolars, but this is just an early onset, a childhood version. And they convinced everybody this is true, and they started using medications appropriately for that condition, which was, by the way, not appropriate if they're not really bipolar. And so the pharmaceutical companies were thrilled, and never, you know, they were happy. But we, we had this huge numbers of people being diagnosed bipolar just because they were irritable, and they had no other symptoms of mania, nothing else to suggest bipolar. They didn't even have a family history suggesting bipolar. <clears throat> Interesting. So. This, oh, did I say 20-fold? Excuse me, 40-fold increase. 40-fold <laughs> increase in the diagnosis of, of, of bipolar disorder in children. 
uh, from these years. Now, something's wrong with that. So what the, what the psychiatrists were saying that this is a, a broader, this is a broader phenotype. It's just a broader vision because children are different, and so they're, they, they, they're more chronic. And, but it's the same condition. Well, it's not. The research on severe mood dysregulation, not a DSM-IV diagnosis, but the, the research on severe mood dysregulation shows that these children do not, the ones who are chronic, they do not evolve into bipolar disorder as adults. That does not happen. They are a completely different group. So the research does not support this idea that every irritable child is bipolar. Does not support it. This condition is unique and not just a subtype or an early onset of bipolar disorder. And the research, oh, by the way, Geller is another excellent researcher. She's terrific. I, I love her work. And L Lubinhoff is my hero. She's the, one of the best researchers in this whole field. She works in NIH and she is terrific. She's done this, this excellent research on severe mood dysregulation. She was on the committee for this DMDD for DSM-5. But I wish she had insisted that they use the, the same term and call it because we have all the research. And now we have a, a condition which is a little bit different and we have no research to back it up. Not only that, we have another problem. You know when they develop a new, a new diagnosis, they do some testing. <laughs> they do trials, testing trial. Before they release the, the book and sell it to you, they do trials. And they had 2,000 children being diagnosed by two trained psychiatrists to see if, is the diagnosis of DMDD reliable? Why do they care if it's reliable? Because if it's not reliable, it can't be valid. <laughs> you can't be more valid than you are reliable. And so you look for reliability. Well, they had the lowest level of reliability of any diagnosis that you would, you would want to consider for, for DSM-5. Very poor reliability, and that's not good, and they really, I think, should not have released it. But they sell a lot of books, and it's very good for the American Psychiatric Association, I guess, I don't know, but they released it anyway, even though very, the capital levels were 25, very poor, extremely poor levels of reliability in 2,000 children for this condition. Should have been thought through better, I think. But, that, you know, <clears throat> so th th there are problems. Number one, it's not reliable, not very reliable. Number two, there's no research, zero. So we're now dealing with a condition for which there's no research. We don't know what the treatment should be. It's different. So it, it, you end up with coming to see me, an expert, because there's nothing in, in there's, there are no double blind placebo controlled trials that show you which treatments are best, which, which kind of discipline is best, which kind of medication is best. Nothing is only for severe mood dysregulation, but not for DMDD. And how is it different? DMDD does not have any arousal, whereas severe mood dysregulation required arousal, hyper arousal. So there's a slight difference there. And there, you can't assume that their research for one applies exactly to the other. Problem. <clears throat> So the controversy, as I've explained, is because it's, you know, they don't want to pathologize uh, something which is normal in two-year-olds. But this is not two-year-olds. This is only six and above. And it's only three times more, three more three times on the average, three times a week for at least a year, out of proportion to the provocation. Very important. Out of proportion to the provocation. And there's negative moods between outbursts. There's negative moods chronically, between negative mood being irritability for them. You do know negative moods are in the left brain, positive moods are in the right. Did I mention that? Okay, one more little piece of information. Oh, also, the tendency to approach somebody <laughs> is in the left brain. The tendency to avoid somebody is in the right brain. So here we have this little problem. If the left brain is the, is the positive mood, the right brain is the negative mood, but the left brain is approach and the right brain is withdraw, then what the hell is aggression? Excuse the expression, I'm from Brooklyn. <laughs> what's, what's aggression? Aggression is you want to assault somebody, you want to approach because you're angry, which is a negative mood. Which piece of brain is working? Isn't that a puzzler? Mm-hmm, interesting. We're doing research on that very question. And what we found is that for DMDD, it's the left brain. It's the approach, it's, it's nothing to do with, it's the left brain that is involved and it's more so, it's twice as often the left brain in males than it is in females. And the right brain 
is much less involved in both sexes, both genders. And it's much more left frontal in males and it's much more left limbic in females. Suggesting, and again, this is all suggestion, yet we certainly don't have the answer, but suggesting that males have too little control while females have too, many, too much emotion. <laughs> this is being published this year in the American Neuropsychiatric Association meeting coming up this next month. And it's, we're also submitting another study. All our studies are in the references. If you see Fisher L, those studies are all mine and my colleagues. And also if you see Fisher W, those studies are my son's. My son is a psychologist. Okay. My son is at the, uh, he's a psychologist at the University of Pittsburgh in epidemiology. And he did a lot of research for us. And if you see someone named Matthews, he's, he's a, a neuropsychiatrist and those studies, I am co-authors on those studies. And if you see one named Chin, Chin is a geneticist. And we did some genetic studies because we believe you're gonna be diagnosing this condition with blood tests because it's probably genetic because we found 100% of the sample had a genetic polymorphism of DAT1, the dopamine, the dopamine transporter gene. And so we think you're gonna be able to just do a, do a simple blood test and diagnose it uh, very easily in the future. But right now, so we did some, so there's a couple of studies you'll see in these references from Chen, where we were co-authors. He did the stuff because we don't, we're not geneticists, but we, they were our patients. <laughs> and so, the Chen studies are ours, so uh, most of the references you'll see in the back are studies we've been doing with these kids. Yes, sir. Uh, along those lines, the, the blood tests, I'm sure I'm, I'm, that's not your part, but are they doing that? I mean, ongoing, like, you know, are they looking at the history of the parents, you know, whether it was like, I don't know, a prolonged childbirth during delivery where they had hypoxia or oxygen deprivation or maybe mold in the homes. I mean, mold? I hadn't thought of mold. We hadn't, hadn't looked blood, into that. In the parents and other siblings. I can only tell you that just from, from the fact that we have seen thousands of children uh, over these 20 years, that premature babies are very common. There is hypoxic problems, even though they give them oxygen. And even though they don't think there's anything wrong with them, there is, you'll see there's a little, little late in development and slower in school, and there is a mild brain problem. By the way, mild brain problem does not mean trivial. They could be mild, but what if it's in the amygdala? Or what if it's in the frontal breaks? So yes, we see a lot of that. We see a lot of um, difficult deliveries. So you can get frontal lobe problems from squeezing you know, the delivery. We see individuals who use alcohol during the last trimester of, of, uh, of the pregnancy, which shrinks the brain. And what's, what's shrinking in the last trimester? The frontal lobe, the last piece to grow, and that shrinks with alcohol. Um, with drug abuse, you see problems in the limbic system. So we think there's all sorts of prenatal or perinatal brain issues which make these kids vulnerable, either or the genetics which make these kids vulnerable. They now have vulnerabilities, and then anything in life that stress stirs up this, these vulnerabilities, then it brings out this chronic thing. And then once you get it, you got it. It's like an epilepsy. Once you start it, you got it, you know. And if you're looking at oxygen, I mean, aren't you also doing studies on, if they have like sleep apnea, you know, chronic smokers in the house, I mean, because- Well, we have an awful lot of conditions. We have only so many lives to do this research. But we are doing as much as we can, and we have looked, you know, we have done two, two kids with DMDD, because we did that just when the diagnosis first came out. But we've done these for years, we've been doing research, and all of these conditions, and we've done on the need for antipsychotics, and whether you can stabilize them without antipsychotics. You can look in the back and you'll see all, all, all the studies we've been doing. We have, it's not up to us to do it all. It, we're doing a lot. But we need now to do it with this new diagnosis because what we have is something which was called, was called mood disorder NOS. And now we have a new condition and we need to do it on this specific condition.